Ladies and gentlemen, as promised, I have the man himself, the one and only, the true, the shaved. Yeah, shaved. <laughs> David Breivik. Well, I'm afraid you have to change the name of your company now. <laughs> to No Beard Games or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly like that. <laughs> So yeah, it grows back really quickly. It'll be back in a couple of weeks. Couple of weeks, damn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. So talking about Blizzard, the good yeah. old, old Blizzard. How did it all begin? Uh, well, it was originally it was two separate companies. We were development companies. Uh, we we were just doing uh, kind of work for hire things, uh, contracts with publishers. Uh, back then, publishing was very different than it is right now. Now you can, you know, anybody can distribute anything. But back then, you had to have, you know, physical cartridges made and stuff like that. Cost a lot of money to make those cartridges and ship them here, and then, and then push them, you know, all over the world or all over a territory or whatever. You had to have trucking and things like, you know, that just were way beyond the scope of what we were trying to do, which is just make video games. Uh, so we. There are lots of little game developers back then, but very few game publishers. So we would do a lot of work for game publishers uh, in hopes that someday we'll be able to make our own kind of game. Um, and uh, so Blizzard was a company called Silicon and Synapse, and uh, Blizzard North was a company called Condor. And we were uh, both just development companies. We met at a trade show called uh, the... Uh, consumer electronic show in Las Vegas and uh, and we were working on a we were working on a Super Nintendo version of a game I mean I'm sorry we were working on the Genesis version and they were working on the Super Nintendo version and so we we kind of met through that and then uh, kind of long story short they uh, they had just been purchased uh, and become a publisher instead of just a developer and we're looking for for people to uh, to make games and so we uh they they showed hey we're making our first pc game we're going to make pc games and distribute them and we're looking for more people and uh they showed us warcraft one at that show and uh we thought it was awesome so i called them a few months later and asked if they needed any beta help or you know testing or anything and they said yeah and then i pitched them hey i got this great idea and they said well after we finish warcraft one we'll come out and we'll listen to your idea and you can pitch us as to you know making a new pc game with us so they came out in january after they finished warcraft one and we pitched them diablo and they loved it and uh we signed the contract within a week or so and uh that was kind of the beginning of uh, blizzard when they were acquired and changed their name to become a publisher they changed it from silicon and synapse to to blizzard and then uh then we signed the contract to do Diablo, and about a year after we signed the contract, we became, they acquired us and became, uh, we became Blizzard North. This was still the clay version of Diablo, or still the dark version? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, it was only the clay version for, you know, I don't know, maybe like, <laughs> like a couple weeks or something like that, and then we realized that, like, how difficult that was going to be, and it was just, well, it wasn't really... We entertained that for a very short time. I mean, we kind of had this concept because there was a arcade machine that was pretty popular at the time called Primal Rage. And we thought it looked really cool. The graphics were unbelievably detailed. And it looked a little bit like kind of the old um, uh, uh, kind of stop motion movies that, that like clash of the titans and things that, that had uh, that had that kind of claymation stuff in it and we really liked the look of that and we thought oh it'd be cool to make that in a video game but then we realized how difficult it was going to be and uh and kind of quickly abandoned that idea but it was still but when we pitched them it was you know we pitched them the turn-based <laughs> claymation single player dos game uh that uh, that became something very different by the time we uh you know, multiplayer, Windows 95, DirectX, <laughs> uh, not claymation, like in <laughs> real time. I mean, almost everything about the pitch, everything about the, the the pitch changed except for the core of it, which was random levels, random items, fighting monsters, that kind of thing, stuff. So how do you go from uh, Primal Rage uh, stop motion to Diablo, the actual Diablo? 
Uh, well, uh, we knew what we wanted. We still, it was kind of a dark gothic game. That was something that we wanted to make all along. So it was going to be claymation in terms of, you know, that's, that's what our, our images would look like. But the theme was always going to be kind of anti-fantasy that it was not, uh, the typical fantasy things that were happening at that time. Most of the fantasy stuff at that time was, uh, kind of Lord of the Rings inspired, where it would be uh, elves and uh, and uh, you, you know just kind of the standard classes and the um, and you know dwarves and and uh, things like that. And so we wanted to kind of get away from that. We wanted to separate ourselves in in a different way. So we wanted to go really dark and scary, more horror side of things, kind of gothic look to it, rather than. Uh, what was you know kind of elves and high fantasy which uh which is was very popular at that time and so to make ourselves stick out in a certain way this was this was kind of the the theme that we went along went with all along so it was always even when it was claymation was going to be a dark and kind of uh, scary game and uh then it was easy to uh to render the stuff in we used 3D Studio Max to make all the models and things like that. And it was easy to make kind of a dark, scary look. And we had a couple mantras in the in the office where it was always add more blood, add more fire to, to things. So like we've come up with these images and how can we make this look more bloody or be on fire or do something like that <laughs> to make it, to, you know, even more darker and scarier. So that was... That was it, and sometimes we crossed the border and we ended up having to take some of the stuff out that was maybe like a little too edgy. Uh, but uh, we, you know, it was it was definitely pushed the limits uh, of what was kind of acceptable at the time, uh, which was fun. And that garnered some attention for us, which was which was nice. What was your best what? moment in Blizzard? Um... That's a great question. I'm not really sure. I mean, for me personally, the moment that Diablo went from turn-based to real-time uh, was such a magical moment in my career, uh, in my life, uh, that uh, it was it was just so profound that, uh, you know, I still remember it with crystal clarity. Uh, but I would say that there were just so many great times that was from kind of the friendships that I that I formed with the people there and the uh, the uh, uh, you know having the success with Diablo that we did and the and the uh, the you know reaction of the fans and stuff like that was just wonderful and some of the letters we would get and and stories that we heard from fans and and things like that really made it just such a wonderful time that it's uh, it's hard to choose one specific thing because there are just so many great moments that winning you know awards and uh, and and the having tons of people that were just really excited about the product uh, was was just all you know made it all worth it there were there were definitely lows you know there were lows and highs and uh, and uh, the lows, you know, working so hard and so many hours and all these kind of things, it was extremely difficult. Uh, but at the same time, the rewards were super sweet. What's your biggest regret? <sighs> hmm. I think I think my biggest regret is that I wasn't. Is that. I think that fame and fortune and ease of making something came too early for me. You were 29, uh, I believe, or something like that. Uh, yeah, I was 20, was I 27 or something like that when we sold the company? I don't something like that. I, I, it was somewhere right around there. So I was, I was quite young. Uh, and uh, I think that that... Like I just didn't have I, I was I was kind of a late bloomer anyway, but I did not did not have the maturity that and wisdom that I do now. And so I don't really know if I have a lot of regrets. I mean, I wish that I knew more. I wish that I understood better kind of the magic of what we had. Um, 
because after leaving it, I realized just how much more difficult it is than I thought it would be. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I don't really regret all that much because I wouldn't be in the situations I am now where I'm super happy. So, uh, it, it is what it is. You can, you can, every, every, every decision has advantages and disadvantages and you'll never know whether or not you made the right one or not. Cause there's no going back. Well, I suppose you made uh, a lot of good decisions if you are where you are now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope so. At, le at least I think that they're pretty good, but <laughs> things have turned out pretty well. <laughs> have you ever fired anyone? Have I ever fired anyone? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Yeah. I've, I mean, sadly, I've, I, I was CEO of Gazillion. I had to fire hundreds of people. I mean, I have fired, personally fired hundreds and hundreds of people. And it's a terrible, terrible thing that I have to, that it was just part of the job. Uh, it sucks. It really sucks. Uh, and it's probably the hardest part of any job. Um, I even had to do things like fire my best friend, which is not easy. So, yes, Jesus. I have. How did it go, actually? I mean, fighting your best no, friend. Well, <laughs> he was no longer my best friend. No, oh, god damn it. <laughs> Dang. Well, I suppose that's one of the worst moments in your career. Yeah, uh, that ranks right up there in the worst moments. <laughs> How did it actually happen? I mean, did you hint it? Or you went like, sorry, mate, but uh, I have to cut you. Uh, there were some hints. It wasn't that much of a surprise, but it was still a surprise because I believe that they thought that they were, you know, Immune? yes. <laughs> it was a, a, a discipline firing or like, uh, I'm not going to talk about it, but it just, <laughs> you know, it, it was what it was. Okay. So, uh, someone in another video, I will link it to you if you want to, but said that and of course you cannot answer this question you receive bonuses up to seven hundred thousand a year is there any truth to that well i won't count on the amount but it was a large amount and uh yeah we did receive large bonuses sometimes for the products that we were making oh. honestly I honestly don't remember the exact amounts, but they were they were there were lots of money. There was a lot of money. There were many people that received, you know, six figure checks in the company, including you, uh, including me. Yes, absolutely. I made I made money off Diablo. There's no doubt. Uh, but it wasn't just me. There were plenty of other people that were making big checks. Absolutely. How did it all end? Well, it ended when. Um, we were uh, kind of having disagreements with the, not not Blizzard South, but the ownership of the company, Vivendi. And uh, we were having some disagreements with them and they were not uh, letting us participate kind of in our in our future that we wanted to participate in. And, uh, and we tried to work it out for a long time and eventually there was a large chance that we could lose everything and, uh, and I didn't, we didn't want that to happen. We decided to take it into our own hands and decided to split off and and uh, and try and have a future where our success is you know can can still be ours without uh, without uh, you know basically what we viewed as corporate people getting most of the uh, most of the reward. Pretty much the situation right now with Blizzard. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I mean, again, I don't really know even... I haven't worked at Blizzard in 15 years, so I don't know exactly what... Yeah, what you, you, must, what? Uh, you must still have uh, friends there that you talk regularly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. I have friends that are that are there, many friends that are there, uh, and I still talk to regularly. So, I mean, the, the situation there has totally changed. The, the company is so different than when I was there. They have thousands of employees now. When I was there, the total in the whole company was like... I mean, I, when we left, it was maybe like 250 total or whatever, you know, it was like, <laughs> and to go from that to thousands of employees, they, everything changes. The politics change, the structure changes, the, the, you know, the titles change, the compensation changes, everything changes. We're going to go back to the new Blizzard uh, later in the interview. So talking about Path of Exile. Yeah. What's, what's your role in GGG? 
Uh, I am just doing a lot of consulting for them in China, helping them. I was helping them, you know, with Tencent uh, and uh, and getting the game in China and and marketed in China and you know adjusted for Chinese audiences. So uh, I, I did that and you know gave them feedback on the game and stuff like that. But uh, you know, take that all with a grain of salt. 99.99% of that stuff that uh, they do is all them. And they are, they are very talented. Why China? Why you in China? Because uh, I have some experience. I have quite a bit of experience, actually, of getting games in China and working with a Chinese audience uh, with a, on a number of titles, actually. So uh, the, the Tencent reached out to me to, ha have, to, to help. I see. Have you ever met Chris Wilson? Oh yeah, many many times. We yeah. just had dinner. I don't know, a couple months ago. So <laughs> we 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 yeah, we we hang out a lot. We chat a lot. What kind of guy is he personally and not oh, professionally? He's, he's just awesome. He's such a cool guy. He's so fun. He's really nice, really considerate, extremely smart. He, he he's just he's a great person. How do you see the future of Path of Exile? Uh, well, I think the path of exile future is bright. Uh, I think that they'll continue doing what they're doing, but I also believe that, you know, this is all speculation. I have no inside information, but they've got to, you know, be working or thinking about maybe a newer version or an enhanced version or like, I, I, I don't know how would they even do it. I don't know if you would want to give up on what you've got right there. So I, I, maybe they just keep adding to what they have. But uh, I also imagine that there's probably a cry for, hey, we can, you know, make another version where we can learn what we've learned from making this one and, and put it in the, a new one and make it, you know, different in some way. I think that new that engine? would be a thing for them as well. New engine maybe? New engine, yeah. New engine, some new technologies, things like that. Being able to maybe uh, make uh, instances where there's a lot more people playing together or they can do group things like raids and stuff like that. I mean, I think that that's the future of action role-playing games. And uh, there's no reason why they technically couldn't be the first to do those kind of stuff. How long have you played uh, Path of Exile? Uh, pretty much since it came out. Uh, the first time uh, I met Chris was... God, five, I don't know, about five years ago or so. So it was right around there when I started playing it. How old is Path of Exile now? That's It's about five years old, right? Seven years around. Okay, yeah. So it was like, let's say five or six years ago that I first met him. And uh, and and start, we met at a game developers conference. I don't remember how our paths crossed. Oh, we were at this event and uh, they were showing off my game and and path of exile and we were at the same event together and and i they were talking about it or whatever and we ended up meeting while we were there at the at that event or whatever for, for the first time and that was the first time i had seen the game and so then i i i kind of promptly downloaded and started playing so i don't know a long time i've been playing since then I can imagine Chris going, oh my god, it's perfect, it's perfect, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that at first it was a little bit like that, uh, and uh, but as they got to know me and stuff, then our relationship changed from kind of the that that to more, you know, peers, which is great. Now, this is probably the point where everybody wants your opinion on the current state of Blizzard. Okay. What's your take on it after the debacle of Diablo franchise? Uh, sorry, the Diablo Immortal. The way fans uh, got, let's say, treated, uh, uh, and everything that sparkled. That like, let's call it disaster because pretty much that's what it is. The Diablo Immortal thing. What's your take on it? Well, I think that uh, I've stated publicly several times now that, um, you know, I think that there were kind of three big takeaways, which was, I, I agree that everybody has all the right in the world to be upset and, uh, and disappointed in the announcement. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, there is a fine line between being upset and having constructive feedback and being 
<laughs> and being absurd, right? You know, like the, getting into the kind of death threat territory and stuff like that is is taking it too far. Uh, uh, so you know, don't go there. You can Absolutely. be you can be vocal, but uh, don't go there. <laughs> Uh, and then two is that, you know, for me, I, I'm in a kind of a wait and see mode. I mean, they announced it. And so, uh, and I understand they announced it. Uh, and that's kind of my third point, which we'll talk about in a second. But I'm kind of in a wait and see thing. Like, we don't really have very much information. The information we do have, everybody's speculating on what it's going to be like or what it is or like, because it's other things making, it's going to be a money grab and all these kind of stuff. But we, we actually don't have any details. And it's all, you know, everybody kind of voicing their opinion about what it would be. So I'm going to be waiting for more details and try not to get too hyped or too disappointed or anything and just wait for more information before I really kind of decide whether or not it's going to be a game for me. And most likely, you know, it's going to be a, a free-to-play game. So downloading it and trying it is it's pretty easy. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. So, uh but I think third is that I think Blizzard would even admit this at this point, and I think that they knew this kind of going in, is that uh, that you know that the timing of the announcement and the way that they announced it was extremely poor. Uh, you know, in hindsight's twenty twenty, but uh, the it, the fact is that here was it, you know they kind of like built up the hype that oh we're going to announce something about Diablo uh, at this at this at BlizzCon this year, and that immediately gets all the ears perked. For all the people that are big Diablo fans, are super excited about finally some new good Diablo stuff. All right, yeah, let's do this. And so people spend a bunch of money and they fly out there and they get the tickets and they do all these kind of things and they start getting super hyped. And then I think Blizzard realized that people were getting too hyped. And then like what a week or so before <laughs> they were going to make the announcement, they're like, everybody kind of calm down. It's not <laughs> this is not going to be that big of an announcement or whatever, you know. So I I think that they realized that the the hype had been like built out of control and uh and so when it wasn't a diablo 4 announcement which is what i think people were speculating and for like weeks people would come onto our stream and i would say don't get your hopes up <laughs> you know <laughs> i don't think it's gonna be that big of an announcement i mean everybody's like no they're gonna announce it. i don't think they're gonna announce anything and i ta i've talked a lot about why it doesn't make sense for blizzard to announce anything probably almost ever uh, and, uh, it, you know, they should do it Apple style. They should announce something and have it on the shelf in six weeks. Uh, so, because uh, they don't need the hype, the hype's there. So in the, in the, in announcing it a year off or two years off or three years off just makes it so they have endless questions. So I, I figured that Diablo four is going to take a while if they're working on it. I don't have any information as to whether or not they are or anything, but, if they're working on it, it's going to take a while. So why would they announce it now? Why? Is, so I, I, you know, it's only been let's let's speculate and say, oh, they've been working on it for two years or something. I don't know how long they have, or even if they are, but imagine it's in the two year range. But there's probably going to be at least two, three, four more years before it would be done. So why would they announce it now? It seems like they wouldn't announce anything for years. And so you know, I I was speculating that it wasn't going to be that. But I still think that a lot of people got super excited about it. Blizzard tried to kind of back off on it. But then they announced a mobile game to a bunch of hardcore PC Diablo fans. And it went over poorly. Uh, not only did it go over poorly because that was the only announcement, but also the way that they announced it and things like that, to whom they announced it and all of this was just the wrong way to go about it. I think that... The game would have been a lot that the announcement would have gone over a lot more smoothly if it was similar to kind of the way that they announced Diablo on the Switch, right? It was just like, you know, it was an announcement that wasn't at BlizzCon. It wasn't like this cornerstone of what they were going to announce at the, at the show, but it was just a, hey, we're also going to do this Diablo Immortal game or whatever on the phone. You know, they wouldn't have had the same kind of level of backlash that it did. It was mainly because of this, these circumstances of they had built it up. They had a bunch of people that were the wrong audience that they were announcing it to, and uh, and it did not go over well. So I think that that was, it was a bad marketing strategy. It was bad, bad delivery. And I, you know, I feel badly for them, for the poor people that were on stage having to deliver that and then face the kind of wrath that they had to. Uh, uh, but, you know, it, it was a big mistake. Is it the end of the world? No. Uh, is it the end of Blizzard? No. 
Is it the end of Diablo? No. Because uh, you... If they announce Diablo 4, I don't know, a year from now or two years from now, people are going to be excited about it. And maybe Diablo Mortal is not the game for you, but that's okay. Not every Diablo game has to be the game for you. Diablo Immortal is going to reach a different audience maybe than their PC audience. Now, again, announcing that to your PC audience was kind of a bad idea. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I think that there's still plenty of hope that the Diablo four or a Diablo new Diablo game will come in the future and it'll be what fans want. Isn't that a risk that people are so pissed with uh, Diablo and Blizzard in general that they divert to other products and maybe in two years there would be something different if not better than any other Diablo game? Sure, absolutely it's a risk. It's always a risk. But it's hard for me to believe. Blizzard has so much incredible power in the industry that uh, and Diablo, you know, has some a legion of hardcore fans uh, that it seems pretty unlikely that uh, I mean, people might still be feel a little bit burnt. But I mean, look at Star Wars. I mean, Star Wars survived episodes one, two, and three, okay? I mean, those were some of the worst movies of all time. And, <laughs> and it, you know, it... it, it I don't know well. <laughs> Star Wars is as big as ever. There's like, you know, and yeah, there was backlash on the la latest film or whatever. Not, I mean, not two films ago now. Solo was the latest film, but before that, uh, The Last Jedi. But the, uh, but, you know, there there have been some gems in there too. There, you know, there's been some good ones and some bad ones. And so that that's... The way it goes and so i think that it's just like anything else i think that do you think that fallout franchise is ruined now that fallout 76 has come out i don't think so i think there'll still be plenty of people that'll be super excited about a new fallout game do you think fallout is ruined because of fallout shelter no not at all so i don't think that uh that diablo is ruined or will not carry the cachet that it does now because of this announcement i think this will be water under the bridge two years from now and people barely even remember it'll be a kind of a footnote uh but i think that people will be just as excited about a new diablo you know hardcore product uh as they will as they would today as they will you know two years from now well i was very excited for diablo 3 as well i drove for 300 kilometers to gift diablo 3 to a friend he wow was, he was uh, on the phone with me with of course hands free while i was driving <laughs> back uh, this doesn't work, it doesn't work, uh, error 27. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that was... They survived uh, error 27. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was that was a bad time for them. But, uh, but it, you know, they got past it. People forgave them. So. <clears throat> True. And Diablo 3 didn't have the greatest launch. Like, people didn't like the real money auction house and some stuff like that. And that didn't kill the Diablo franchise. So I don't know how an announcement of a, a mobile game is going to get... I, you know, ruin it. Yeah, it just doesn't seem even likely. Right. Especially, maybe, maybe it's the greatest mobile game of all time. We don't know. Okay, I gotta. What happens? It's I'm the gonna... greatest mobile game of all time. I'm gonna keep this uh, this statement out of the interview. Okay. <laughs> 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 Diablo Immortal, the greatest mobile game of all time. I think... Yeah, we don't know. I, we haven't I... seen it. Well, uh, if uh, Chris Wilson gets wind of that statement, I don't think you're going to work for him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just speculating. We don't know anything. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. It could so, end up being the worst mobile game of all time, too. There are, you know, you got to play both coins. But the, uh, the fact is that, you know, everybody's kind of judged it before we even know anything about it, which is, I think, unfair. But, honestly, it is in the realm of possibility that it would be a money grab like oh you want sure. a new character pay 20 euros uh you want this item pay five euros Except yeah maybe for, for dollars maybe in case. uh maybe not what if it's just cosmetics mm, could be all right yeah <laughs> so then it's kind of still a money grab in terms of you have to like pay money to make your character look really pretty but you know, it's not. That's that's okay to a lot of people. If you, if wars only cosmetic, yes. I mean, yeah, Path of right. Exile is making again. So we don't know. <laughs> we don't we don't have the information. So jumping to a conclusion that it's gonna be this way, I think, is kind of faulty. I, Blizzard yeah. has not shown that they're that kind of company, and I think we got to give them the benefit of the doubt. All right. 
If you would offer to lead Blizzard once more, would you accept it right now in this state, in this moment? No, no chance. Not Absolutely right now. Absolutely not. No, no. Reason being, I don't wish that job on anybody. That is an extremely difficult job. <laughs> Reason being, uh, the expectations for anything you do are are incredibly high. And for me especially, like if I went back and made a Diablo game, imagine how much pressure and hype there would be if, for me going back and working on Diablo. Like, Honestly, in my opinion, if a company like Blizzard would do a remake, a complete remake of Diablo 2 with some, of course, uh, quality of life improvement, I believe will be one of the most successful games of all time. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. But I also believe that, you know, that it's a little bit like whatever, whenever you're going to make something that's got so much scrutiny, whatever, whatever, whatever the big IPs are, if you're doing a, a DC movie or if you're doing a Marvel movie or if you're doing a Star Wars movie or whatever, like the amount of scrutiny and pressure on these people is incredible to meet fans demand and fans are, 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 pin, you know, finicky. And if it doesn't have everything that they desire, then, you know, they've kind of turned their nose up on it and they move on to something else. So it's extremely difficult. Now it's hyper competitive. It's way different than it was when Diablo two came out. Uh, so, you know, like going back, the expectations would just be so high Especially if I went back and I led Blizzard, then it wouldn't just be about one product. It'd be about all the products and all this kind of stuff. So it would just be a really difficult job, I think. Let's pretend that you were magically the head of Blizzard. What would you change okay. first? The first thing you would say, no, this has to change. That's a great question. And uh, I honestly don't know because... I really don't know Blizzard very well, right? The Blizzard that that I knew is not the Blizzard it is today. So it would be hard for me to say, hey, these are the things that need to change. Uh, maybe, maybe nothing needs to change. I don't know what they have in development. Maybe they're doing development in a different way than they've done it. I mean, it seems to me that their development teams, uh, you know, have not, like they've had some tr trouble developing things. Uh, uh, you know, Diablo 3 took a little while for them to kind of like turn it around and get the expansion thing. The Heroes of the Storm, uh, you know, was was kind of a, a difficult launch. Some of their latest expansions on StarCraft were not, you know, super popular. Uh, so they've had a lot of success with Overwatch until Fortnite came out. Uh, and so I think that there's like a, you know, are they doing development, everything they can to kind of spark creativity and new IPs and things like that, uh, that, you know, are they hungry enough for those kind of things? Those are very difficult things to do in a big company. And, uh, and so, you know, trying to create a circumstance where that, where creativity and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, new ideas can blossom uh is is very very difficult and like in a new company in a big company there's just so many so m much politics involved in that kind of stuff because everybody wants to make their name as the guy who made something awesome and new at blizzard like that is a dream career changing defining goal uh for for m most game developers and so you know everybody wants that and to be able to have the opportunity to do that you got to believe it's super political when uh, you were on uh, the Jungle Queen uh, stream, when she was yes. streaming uh, Path of Exile, you ranted about uh, the yeah. bonus programs, and a fairly large YouTuber yeah. stated, I don't know if he was drunk or what, so you, do you still uh, back up those claims? <clears throat> uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do, I back up the screams as, uh, I mean, as this was my conspiracy theory. The thing is that that clip ended up, they like just showed a little bit of what happened that day. First off, that was like weeks and weeks ago. It was like at the beginning of October that that happened. Uh, and this was before the Diablo Immortal announcement and stuff. And we say stuff on the stream all the time. There are hundreds that we've, we've been streaming for, for four or five years now, like five nights a week. And we say all sorts of stuff. So the fact that that weird little clip ended up after I'd been 
over at uh, Max and Eric Schaefer's house uh, playing poker and <laughs> came back. I was a little drunk and I and I came onto this thing and I I had this conspiracy theory about what what could be happening. And I said, look, I have no evidence that this is happening. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have any. You can imagine that this is a possibility, but maybe it's not. Maybe I'm totally wrong or whatever. But they left all of that out of the clip. Instead, they just got the little snippet of me ranting about, hey, this is something that could have gone down. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that uh, do I believe that the conspiracy theory? Probably not. It's probably not accurate. I don't have all the inside information just from 50,000 feet. This is what it looks like as a possibility. Uh do I believe that it could be possible? Sure, absolutely, it could be possible. I mean, that's why I said it. Uh, but again, I don't, I don't have any of the facts, so who knows? I, I think that uh, that it's, you know, it is a guess as to what was going on, but it might be completely off. So you were a little drunk. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. I've been, I've been playing poker all night with my friends. You know, like it was the old blizzard north crew together playing poker it was you know there was going to be some drinking <laughs> drink and play poker all right <laughs> what's your take on the current state of the video game industry with all the loot boxes controversy the banning in the in several states uh, all the misogyny accusation of you know left right and center yeah, well, I think that that's there. Wow, that's a very broad question, and there's a lot of answers, and I could probably talk for a half an hour just on that. But uh, I think that in general, the the state of the industry is pretty healthy. Uh, however, it is it has changed so dramatically uh, from even in the last five years. It's changed dramatically. The fact that everybody can make a game that can reach everybody on the planet at any time. Uh, means that there is just an incredible amount of content being made and, and the competition level is so sky high right now that it's it's hard to even comprehend. There's tons of great games that just fall through the cracks because nobody knows about them, right? Because there's just too many games. There's, there's on Steam, I don't know what it is, it's like 40 games a day or something like that. I mean, it's just like impossible to keep up. It is impossible to keep up with it. With, and so... What ends up happening is it it's kind of a little bit back to the old model where yes everybody can make a game but nobody knows about it because people don't have enough marketing money to spend it so if you want to make a game and have it be successful you have to either get extremely lucky in some weird edge case or you have to have a lot of money and be showing advertisements on tv and all over the place to kind of get people to notice your product and so uh the industry has changed a lot, but it, in all, in a lot of ways, it's kind of stayed the same. Is that the big publishers have these huge advantages? If they want to, uh, they want to do a new IP or you know, to promote a new game. They can demand a lot of attention because they can spend a lot of money. Um, so I think it's a tough time for indies, for smaller publishers. But a lot of times, those are the most creative games because the bigger companies don't want to take as big a risks because too much money is involved and all of these uh, this kind of stuff. So. Uh, I think that that's uh, a tough, you know, it's a tough situation to be in, but if you get lucky, you can break out with a kind of an indie hit still, and it's still possible for it to happen. It's just less and less likely every day. Um, so I think that that's, that's one thing. So in some ways, it's super healthy. In some ways, it's kind of back to the old model of big publishers. Uh, but, you know, everybody can dream and anybody can make something happen. And even if you don't have a lot of success with a small indie game, you can maybe get noticed by a bigger company and have a chance to work on something, uh, you, know, a, you know, a bigger title or, you know, make a make a career move that that's good for you in the long term. So I think that that's pretty cool. Um, you know, people make games for a living now. There's lots of money in it. And that's a lot different than it was a long time ago. When I started in the industry, like there were so few people working on video games and publishers were making most of the money, the developers weren't. And so it's really cool that, that that's not necessarily the case anymore. And the people that were making all the games and were making, doing all the publishing and stuff were just pure businessmen that really honestly didn't even play games. And so like that's changed a lot. And the culture of video games has changed a lot. I do agree that there is, it is, it, 
that there's a lot of misogyny in the in the uh, in in video games. Uh, I think that comes from the fact that in general, uh, most of the audience is male, and so you know having females come into the uh, and into the mix and become gamers uh, is is not only needed and welcome, but it, it's kind of a weird thing I think for some people they don't handle it very well they're like why are women doing my hobby kind of thing and you know so which is kind of ridiculous uh the 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 fact is that they should have all the opportunities in the world to play and enjoy video games just like everybody else play make them do everything and so because the industry was so male dominated from the start computer science was male dominated from the start like when i went to school and i got my computer science degree we had two women in the entire curriculum and so you know it wasn't because there you know it comes from a basis of this was a male dominated field from the very beginning uh, and uh, and so now that it's changing, it's great that it is changing. We're getting much more diverse games. We get a lot more people involved in it. But then we have to kind of break these old habits of the way that uh, we feel about the hobby and whether or not uh, it's acceptable for everybody. It should be acceptable for everybody. There's no reason for it not to be. And uh, it's ridiculous that they're taking anything away from anybody. They're just, they you know, women are just enhancing the, the, the industry, not taking away from it. What about the loot box uh, legal loot box. consequences? This is a really tough thing. Uh, the fact of the matter is that loot boxes are... It, I understand that people are not very happy about loot boxes. The reason that people are doing loot boxes is because loot boxes work. The reason that you keep seeing it is because people are paying money. It's working. As much as people jump up and down about it and fight about it and argue about it and whine about it, they're making money. And the fact is that video game prices have basically not changed in 30 years. And it costs so much more money now to make a video game than it did back 30 years ago. Profits have shrunk on a per title basis. And so you get into uh, a situation where Okay, well, how are we going to make more money? We can't just keep charging more money. We've tried charging more money and our sales dropped. People didn't like that. Okay, well, how are we going to make more money? We got we have to have the opportunity to make more money because we've got we've taken a huge risk here. We've spent, and I'm not exaggerating, there are companies that spend $500 million making a video game. That's a big risk and sometimes it doesn't work out. And so that's a big loss and their other products have to kind of make up for that loss or a lot of people lose jobs. So how are they going to make more money other than raise video game prices? Well, that didn't go over well. So why don't we try and figure out a way to raise video game prices without actually raising video game prices? And there were different models that they've tried. We've tried subscription and that worked for a microsecond and worked really well for for World of Warcraft. But nobody else has really been able to do it since. Uh, they tried, you know, they've tried pure free to play and that didn't, doesn't work as well. So they've tried DLC and that worked OK. And, it, and that's been hit or miss. There have been people that have been excited about some DLC things and sometimes felt ripped off by DLC things. So it was kind of hit or miss. And then loot boxes, which have been popular in Asia, they're like, OK, well, let's try that. And they've tried that in a few games. And that does seem to be working. So I think that it's, you know, you need to be safe borders on gambling there's all sorts of potential problems with it and you need to you know be very clear about rules and stuff like that uh but i think that it is a solution that is working for the video game industry right now and i can't blame them for trying to make more money i mean the fact is that and if it wasn't working they would abandon it right away so obviously it is working despite what people think and people you know are upset about it but that's just the way that things are working and there are extremes of ways that loot boxes work well and when they don't work well like they worked really well in team fortress 2 but they didn't work really well in uh i don't know there was some battle that was like what the uh the star wars battlefield or whatever where there was like to unlock a character you had to like have thousands of loot boxes or something that was ridiculous anyway they, there was like some uh, some big problems with uh, where they've had bad examples and good examples. So that uh, I think that 
it all comes down to the personality of the company and whether or not they want to make it seem appealing. My my answer for this is, hey, if you're going to have loot boxes, make sure that there's a way that people can earn the loot boxes, not just have to pay the money. That's my personal opinion. Uh, but, you know, I'm not in charge of a lot of companies. And, you know, I've tried that in the past and it didn't make a lot of money. Uh, and so maybe I did it wrong. Maybe the right thing to do is to go after the whales. That seems that seems to be the trend. That's the same trend in mobile gaming. Mobile gaming, the prices are outrageously expensive, but people are paying a lot of money. They're do it's the right model, and they've proven it with tons and tons of examples of ways they've tried it other different other ways, and it's not been as successful. The reason that they can keep this model is because they make a lot of money off it. They make the most money doing this model. And they have tons of math and metrics and everything to show, to, to back it up. So I think it's here to stay. You guys, can, everybody can be sad about that. Or they could just stop spending money on loot boxes. <laughs> and, then it, and then they would change the model. So I think that that's really the, the only way that we're going to get rid of it if you don't like it is to stop doing it. Half a billion dollars to make a game. Yeah. Where's the big chunk of that going? To the uh, most of it is to the development staff. Half a billion. Yeah. Well. Oh no. I'm sorry. It, it's also a large amount of marketing money. You can build a city with half a billion dollars. <laughs> but development teams are 350 or 400 people now, and they're working on a game for five years, plus seven years, ten years. That's a lot of money. That's all the time as well. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about your game. Uh, my game is the exact opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Half my a thousand is, dollars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My game has one developer. Me. That's it. Uh, I'm doing everything. I'm doing the uh, the art, the programming. The music, the sound—you know—I'm do, I'm doing it all, uh, and uh, and I, I'm it, the game's called It Lurks Below. It's available now in early access on Steam, uh, and it's basically plays like Diablo, uh, and it is very much modeled like a Diablo-styled game. Uh, but the perspective is kind of from the side, so it looks looks a little bit like maybe a Terraria, Starbound kind of game uh and uh, you know from if you look at the graphics that's the way it looks um kind of pixel art uh looking as as dark and gothic and bloody as i can make 2d pixel art more and blood, uh, more fire more blood more fire <laughs> exactly i need more fire <laughs> I need more blood how am i going to do this um and uh so it's kind of a it it, it very much is like diablo there's a it's a role playing game where you uh you know level up there's a, a lot of character classes at this point let's see there's warrior i just put in paladin there's warrior paladin bard enchanter wizard necromancer rogue uh, I, 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 seven eight classes right now uh there's probably going to be about 10 on release i would guess um and uh and so you choose a class you customize your character and you level up you kind of go go down in the ground so there's a little bit more crafting and kind of mining and stuff you kind of mine down into the earth and mine ore to make your armor and then there's uh gem slots where you i call them crystals where you can you can put the crystals have random attributes on them so you can uh slot different attributes you got lots and lots of stats and as you level up you can spend stat points and you get these items these skill items and you can only hold six of them so there's like different builds you can make with the different skill items and stuff like that so uh it's uh you know it plays like it's lots of fast action lots of you know there's melee as well as range kind of combat lots of uh you know bosses and and whatnot there's going to be a storyline. It's not in there yet, but because uh, it is still early access. But uh, but the game plays well, and people are really excited about it and having a good time. There's lots of super positive feedback uh, from the community, and the community has been very helpful. I communicate with the community a lot. I am 
always answering things on Steam forums. I am talking to people in Discord. Uh, we stream the game several nights a week, and I answer questions, uh, you know, on Twitch. I, I go into other people's Twitch streams and answer questions and stuff. Uh, and so I'm very active in the community. I love making games this way. I love getting feedback on what I'm doing and trying to make the best product. And uh, and uh, and it's just it's a real labor of love. It's a passion project for me, and uh, I'm having I'm just having the best time. I can barely sleep. I'm just so excited about making this thing all the time. <laughs> so when is it gonna be released? I, I don't know. Uh, it'll be done when it's done, uh, kind of thing. But I was I'm guessing first quarter next year. Soon trademark. Yeah. <laughs> So exactly. I thought I would. I thought it would finish by the end of this year, but it's taking a little bit longer. I've also made the game a little bit bigger than I had intended when I thought that it was going to be the end of the year. Uh, but I've made some good changes, and it's all been worth it. So you know, if it slips into the beginning of next year, that's okay. The question that probably everybody is asking right now, watching this interview, is there's going to be a cow level? Yes, absolutely. Every <laughs> single one of my games has a cow level, and really? this is going to be no exception. Who came up actually with the cow level things? Uh, the cow level came from uh, in Diablo One that we had these kind of cows on the outskirts of town, and uh, back then the internet wasn't as you know getting kind of social media or going places and stuff was kind of limited. There just were not very many people online discussing games, or there weren't really good places to go to discuss things and whatnot. So. But people would get these rumors going. So there was this rumor going around that, like, if you clicked on the cow, I don't know, a couple hundred times or something like that, then it would open up a secret <laughs> cow level. But this was all. This was just total BS. There was no. There was no cow level in Diablo One. So, but people would like try this stuff or whatever, and then and then I would get constantly asked about this cow level. Is there really a cow level on this thing? Because I heard on this website that you know, if you click the thing enough, I couldn't get it to happen. But I think I might be doing it wrong. And I was like, no, there was no cow level. That's just a, t a terrible rumor. But then when we were making Diablo 2, we're like, we're putting in a cow level this time. <laughs> so we kind of uh, took, uh, you know, one of the worst parts of Diablo 1 was the NPC Wirt and like people just despised Wirt. And so using his peg leg to kind of like be a facilitator to get to the cow level, we thought would just sounded like complete justice to uh, to when we go to vit back and visit Tristram to to use that uh, to, to get to the cow level. <laughs> Other than uh, the uh, April Fool's joke, uh, drug testing, uh, <laughs> <laughs> shenanigans, were there, were, uh, are there any other pranks pulled in the office? Oh yeah, we, 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 did, we, uh, we did other things. Uh, one was the, 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 the best slash worst one was the one that, where I told everybody that we had to move down to Southern California to finish StarCraft. Uh, but <laughs> for the rest of the year, we had to live down there. Uh, that did not go over well. Uh, the, uh, and then there was a, uh, one where we, <laughs> we were going to, we were going to institute the new, we had, we had been bought or whatever. And that's part of the new corporate policies that are out of our control everybody's got to have time cards <laughs> so you had to like punch in and out you had to like clock your hours on a time card at the up at the front of the office when you went went in and out or whatever and uh and obviously that was fake too but uh but those those are some of the ones i can remember <laughs> <laughs> that must have been a blast working for you. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was terrible and wonderful. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of an asshole thing to do for for me for sure. But the but uh, you know it, it became kind of a tradition at some point. I don't I, is it is a tradition of being a uh, insufferable jerk? Is that okay? I don't I don't really know. But uh, I would never do such a thing anymore. But uh, that was you know kind of my old stupid days, I guess. Any pranks pulled on you? Yeah, there's been pranks pulled on me, but not very many. Uh, usually, I'm pretty suspicious of these things. <laughs> <laughs> you see. All right, it's been almost an hour now. I've stolen too much of your development time for your awesome video game, which, by the way, I purchased. Link in the description. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. It's been a fantastic time. Thank you guys for watching, and as always... Don't forget to improve yourself. <laughs>